On this episode, MAKO TV takes a closer look at the USGA elections, NSU hosted its annual Student Life Achievement Awards, and a quick update on NSU women's and men's basketball teams. I'm Mia Alvarado. And I'm Nicole Shaker. Welcome back, Sharks. The Undergraduate Student Government Association announced the winners of their election. Our reporter Ronnie Prieto has the story. Throughout the month of March, NSU's student government had their elections. The voting was open from March 18th till the 29th. So USJ as an organization is always, is premise is to make change on our campus. Um, I hope to see USJ advocate for our students. I hope to see USJ push student concerns to higher ups and make the student voice heard. Um, that's something I really want to see. I also want to see USJ continue following through on some initiatives. NSU alumni Shivani Patel shares what she hopes to see for the future of USGA. I hope to see more of what we saw this year. I feel like we had a great um, student government this year under President Petty Boina. So I hope that they follow in those footsteps as well as bring new onto campus, um, do something different, and do something that other student governments haven't done before. NSU's Undergraduate Student Government Association ended their elections by announcing the President, Vice President, and Senate. Newly elected president, Daniel Baig, expresses his goals for the next year. So one of our goals really is next year, we really want to establish a lot of partnerships within small businesses. A lot of other schools, they have that partnership. I want to expand our drop week, especially all the other schools, but those are two major goals we really want to hit for next year. The newly elected vice president shares how he plans to support the new president. Well, being already <coughs> great friends with him and knowing that I was um, senators with him before, that I know how to best support him is to be vocal with them and to also just um, push him like as a president he has a big job as vice president I have a big job and just be there to support him and make sure the 37th administration is gonna be a nice one the 37th administration inauguration will take place on April 17th from noon to 2 p.m. I'm Ronnie Prieto with Mako TV thank you Ronnie congratulations to the new elected officers of USGA up next, Volume 21 of Digressions launched with students showcasing some of the work featured in the Literary and Art Journal. Ronnie was there. Digressions Literary and Art Journal held its annual launch in Gallery 217 at the Don Taft University Center. Every year, the journal features a diverse group of student-submitted works. Faculty advisor for Digressions, Dr. Mario Diagostino, shares his passion for the project. Uh, I think sometimes it's, it's hard to see the arts around here, or it can be a challenge to see the arts around here. Um, and so I've been really proud of my time with Digressions because I, I, I know that is, it, it has been a creative outlet for so many students. Um, it's a gratifying experience to see students come up and talk about their work and be really proud of the work that they did. Like that sort of for me is, uh, I think that, that's sort of like the payoff. We spoke to board members and coordinators to find out more about how this 21st issue came to be. Members of the editorial board for Digressions give insight to the process of choosing works to be featured in each issue. The tricky thing about like what gets submitted is really based on like each of us's opinion. You know, everyone reviews differently. Everyone on the editorial board has different experience in different fields of art. Um, it's a it's a process, right? We review what we can, and we're always getting more pieces. So it's like just figuring out where to shift some stuff, where to, where to take it out or where to put it in, you know, filling in those gaps. So we think that art should be impactful and it should evoke emotion. And so we really try to focus on that rather than um, the actual content for our reviewers to have a more unbiased approach to the works. Sophomore Sarah Menko had two of her poems featured in the 21st issue of Digressions. It was a long process. I submitted it, I think, back in October or November. Um, I submitted actually five poems, and two of them got chosen, which I'm very glad that they did. Um, it was constant back and forth speaking with Professor um, Janine Morris and also Dr. Mario D'Angostino. And it was it was long process, but very worth it till the end. It's very nice to have your work displayed over in the university that you attend. Each year, the faculty involved in digressions strive to feature all kinds of art. 
To me, I think what's really significant about this issue is that to me it feels like there are a lot more material art pieces. So there's a piece that's made of completely of yarn, pottery, um, things that aren't static on the page. And so I think it's really cool that uh, we're able to feature um, that kind of art as well. The 21st issue of Digressions was launched on Monday, April 8th. I'm Ronnie Prieto with Mako TV. Next, for our health update, our general manager and reporter Madison Casper sits down with Dr. Artie Raja to discuss the impact artificial intelligence has on healthcare. Welcome to the health update. I'm Madison Casper. Here with me is Dr. Artie Raja, Mako Media Science and Health Advisor. Welcome, Dr. Raja. Thank you, Madison. Our topic today is the use of artificial intelligence in the healthcare system. <music> Dr. Raja, what is artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence, or AI, uh, is basically technology that allows computers to simulate human intelligence and utilize it for problem-solving uh, capabilities. How is AI being used in the healthcare system? AI is already currently used in the healthcare system. Uh, in several ways. Uh, so simple things like the way we make our appointments. So if you're making an online appointment with your healthcare provider, uh, if you are getting those reminder text messages or phone calls that remind you that you have an appointment, or a new uh, parent getting reminded that their child has a vaccination coming up, or uh, maintenance of electronic medical records by hospitals or by physicians' clinics, all these are using some kind of artificial intelligence or AI technology. How can AI assist doctors in detecting early signs of diseases? So the idea behind using AI uh, for disease detection is um, thinking about can we utilize computers to recognize certain patterns or risk for uh, a particular disease condition? Can we develop diagnostic tools where the diagnostic tool can recognize patterns in a patient and indicate or catch um, a, a disease condition earlier than one would if they just waited to get a particular symptom before they showed up at the doctor's office. What are some potential challenges in incorporating AI in patient care? Absolutely. So there are a lot of challenges right now. Uh, and there, they, they, they can be a variety of things. One is just simple, simply trying to figure out how do we keep all this electronic data that we're collecting safe? Uh, how do we protect patient information? Um, how do we ensure um, uh, that the data is accessed by the right people? Uh, and then, of course, how do you make it affordable? How do you make it equitable so that everybody has access to this uh, or the ability to use this kind of technology? And then, of course, there are hurdles with, um, uh, with the laws, like what is okay to collect, what is not okay? Uh, and we're still kind of navigating those uh, parameters, which is what uh, makes, uh, which, which, which are some of the biggest challenges right now, and we're navigating through those at this moment in time. How does this affect college students? Um, so AI is, is going to be a part of almost every field um, in the future. Uh, so that is something college students have to start thinking about. And of course, as college students, when you are studying and you're writing, you're writing papers, you're uh, writing uh, or learning new information, there is AI involved there and kind of navigating through that as well in, as, and figuring out what is okay to utilize uh, from uh, with computer technology, what is not okay to utilize, that landscape is also changing. So a lot of things for college students to think about, pluses and minuses. How has AI affected higher education? We often think of, um, oh, students are using AI to, you know, the first thing that pops up in most people's mind in higher education is, oh, chat GPT. That is a type of generative AI. Um, and the question becomes, are students just utilizing uh, this platform to uh, input some data and have uh, AI write their or do their work for them. Uh, that is one part of it and, um, and, and higher education, universities, NSU included, uh, is constantly thinking about how to um, work with that and how do we evolve, how do we adapt to the presence of this technology. 
Uh, and as an educator, I would imagine this is not something that's just going to disappear. So one way to think about it is how can we all adapt? How do we as teachers, how do we teach? How do we adapt our teaching styles knowing that AI exists out there? And as students, how do you adapt your learning styles and your writing styles and how you grasp information knowing that AI also exists out there? And higher education and universities as a whole are trying to figure out what the best way to move forward with this is. So definitely, yes, it impacts higher education, but there are pluses to it too, and it's not all negative and bad. Any last thoughts? Uh, there is going to be AI. And the question just becomes, how are we all going to learn to adapt and live with it? Um, and that will involve, for example, higher education coming up with appropriate policies for what is okay to use, what is not okay to use. And very similarly, in the healthcare scenario, either governmental agencies or some overseeing agency has to come in and say, this is how AI is going to be used. Uh, and this will hopefully, putting these measures and uh, guardrails in place will also help convince people that uh, this is there and it is not all bad and there is some good to it and we're going to harness the good and figure out how to utilize it uh, in, in an appropriate manner. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Thank you, Madison. This has been the Mako Media Health Update. I'm Madison Casper. See you next time. Thank you, Madison. I wasn't aware of the growth artificial intelligence had, has had on healthcare. What are your thoughts, Nicole? Yeah, it's super interesting, especially since we're at such a healthcare-dominated school. It'll be cool to see how NOVA adapts with that in the future. I agree. NSU has hosted a farmer's market on campus, giving the students a chance to shop in between classes. Our reporter, Will Ruprecht, has the story. NSU recently started hosting their farmer's market outside of the Alvin Sherman Library. Students and staff are able to come out and see vendors and small businesses from all over South Florida. The marketing director for Shark Dining shares why they started this event. NSU started the Farmer's Market, which is an event we like to call Joyful, in the beginning of the semester. And this is an event that we want to continue on as a legacy for it to come every semester at least once that month. Um, and it's truly one where we want students to come out and enjoy this with us. It's a community we're building here with an NSU and Shark Dining. At around lunchtime, students head to the front of the Alvin Sherman Library to see what the market has to offer. Sophomore Ashley Perez shares why she loves attending the farmer's market. Every month for Conclave, I pass it because it's right before the Santa's building, so yeah. It's very fun. I love walking by and smelling all the food and seeing all the cool things. Some sharks expressed concerns about high prices at the farmer's market. I believe it's too expensive for me to even like purchase something, so I feel like that's one of the cons about it. But um, I do a pro that I do see is that small businesses are able to be featured around. It's just the pricing. Other sharks felt the prices were reasonable. I would say the prices are pretty fair, um, just because everyone does put in a lot of work and effort, and they're very passionate about these businesses. So um, we're just here to support them. Patricia Pong Song Chase gives insight to the kinds of products she offers at her stand. Healing blends is all about balancing the body, mind, and spirit because when all three are healthy is when we are our healthiest. So um, we have things that are topical as well as internal for the body, mind, and spirit. Attendees share why the farmer's market is important to NSU. I think the sense of community, it brings people together. It's something that I look at my friends, I'm like, oh, let's go there. Or I, I told my boss and I tell everyone, I know like, hey, you should go check that. Because we have decent food options, but this is way better. Um, I think it's good to bring in uh, local vendors. Um, just that way the community gets more experience. Also, since a lot of people don't have cars, they can't go off campus, it's really nice to bring that in. The last farmer's market of the academic school year will be held on April 17th from 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. It will be resuming in the following fall semester. I'm Will Ruprecht with Mako TV. Thank you, Will. Up next, our reporter Natalia Rodriguez asked our sharks what their favorite study spots are on campus. Let's take a look. Here at NSU, a study a shark studies are. Today, I'm asking students where they like to study here on campus. So where do you think the best study spots on campus are and why? Um, I'd probably say the library. And there's certain um, like lounges around campus 
like the fraternity and sorority like picnic area because it's pretty quiet and they play music. Uh, the second floor of the library because it's not too quiet but it's also like not too loud and it's kind of like peaceful and like you can still talk to your friends and study. I think my favorite study spots are probably the library and like anywhere outside. Where do you find that the best study spots on campus are? Um, I really like outside the in the gardens by Parker, but I also find that sometimes the study rooms inside the commons where I live um, is also really helpful because both of those just provide a bit of a quieter space as opposed to some of the busier spots on campus. I think my favorite study spot would be the second floor of the library by the computers because the computers are easy to access and it's just not too loud there, but it's also not too quiet so I can concentrate. Nice. So what is your strategy to have a good study session? Um, I say you get rid of distractions. I always say um, out of sight, out of mind. So I like to put my phone in my bag and like any other distractions in my bag so I can just focus on my work. Uh, just listen to music, honestly, because I'm a big person. I like to listen to music. So just listen to music and make sure my phone's off. Having a study buddy always helps me out because if I start getting off, uh, off what I'm supposed to be doing, he tells me to lock back in. What is your strategy to have a good study session? Uh, so me and my friends like all have different ways that we study so I feel like it's just nice for all of us to come together like obviously we're all taking the same classes so we all just come together and like we're all studying the same thing so like we all just give our little inputs on how to best memorize different things. Um, one tip if I was to say a good like study session would be uh, implement the Pomodoro technique which is study for 55 minutes take five minute break and then go back again um, it allows you to study continuously over a long period of time and you retain way more information for those looking to spend more time studying the tutoring and testing center is open for appointment bookings I'm Natalia Rodriguez with Mako TV thank you Natalia the Alvin Sherman library is my go-to studying spot Nicole what's yours for me it's the seating outside the student affairs building I always love to study outdoors interesting Stay tuned, on this episode we get a closer look at NSU's 2024 Student Life Achievement Awards, also known as the Stewies. Next, our reporter Yosef Nahon takes a closer look at this semester's new art exhibition here on campus. The 15th annual juried art exhibition opened its doors on the second floor of the Don Taft University Center. Gallery manager Lenique Noel tells us about the exhibition. So in the gallery is all student work. NSU art students from freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, um, different levels, different practices, different mediums. So it, it all came here together in this space. Students tell us the inspiration behind the art they contributed to the exhibition. I decided to portray Simone Veil. She was a Holocaust survivor and also a French politician. And just this month, the right to abortion was incorporated in the French constitution. So that was something she was working forward to before passing away. So I wanted to honor her and just do kind of a tribute to her. So my painting is called Behind the Painting. Uh, I love clowns. I think it's more of the idea behind them. I think of them as the biggest representation against life, that we always have a front, and no matter what, we're always putting a character in front of everybody. But under that, who is that really, you know? And I often feel like that. That's why I constantly call myself, I'm the biggest clown. Judges reviewed all the artwork submitted into the exhibition and presented awards to select students. Very shocked. I didn't expect it. There's so many, I don't know if you guys can see it, but there's so many amazing pieces here. And so I really didn't think I would get an award. If anything, I thought it would be like an honorary mention. But the fact that I won like second place is kind of crazy to me. Honestly, over the moon. <laughs> I'm so excited. I was like when I was like waiting to like find everything, like hearing all the awards, it, it, like, it felt like it was taking forever. My heart was pounding. Like, I was sweating. I was like, oh my gosh, like suddenly it's hot in here. Um, and it was just so like I was so nervous. But honestly, I'm just so honored. I'm so excited to have won first. It means a lot to me. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very honored. <laughs> The gallery will be open for viewing from March 27th till April 19th. I'm Yosef Nahon with Mako TV. Thank you, Yosef. On this week's Sharks in the Arts segment, our reporter Donna Bertel sits down with Olivia Nerd to discuss her participation in the upcoming student choreography showcase. Welcome to Sharks in the Arts. I'm Donna Bertel. Here with me is Olivia Nerd, sophomore dancer in Shark Talent. Welcome, Olivia. Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Pretty good. How are you involved on campus? I'm involved on campus through a program called Shark Talent, um, Shark Talent Scholarship Program. Um, we try to 
immerse NSU within the arts because a lot of people don't even know that we have art majors here. So um, our job is to make sure that everyone on campus is aware and is involved uh, within the arts. How did you start dancing? Um, I started dancing, so I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, so I did competition since I was about 12, and that's about when I started dancing as well. And ever since then, I've just grown a giant passion for it. I love it so much, and so I wanted to continue that here at NSU. And how will you be participating in the Student Choreography Showcase? All right, so I am actually choreographing one piece. Well, actually, that's a lie. I'm choreographing two pieces. Um, I have a solo and a group dance, and then I am uh, participating and performing in three other pieces. So, yeah. And how did you come up with the idea of having a musical theater number for the showcase? I've always wanted to do musical theater. It's my favorite form of dance. I love theater. I love the big faces, the big everything. Um, so Big Spender has been on my agenda for a while. Um, I started thinking about it, I want to say about a year and a half ago. And I wanted to wait until my sophomore year to really put it out there, just to get a feel of NSU, see what's going on. and. Um, I was dance captain for the musical last semester, and so that really helped me transition into choreographing a whole piece. What was the biggest challenge you faced when doing your first group choreography? I would say the biggest challenge that I faced was the teaching aspect. I've never really done that before. I've only done it for little master classes here and there, so I pop in and pop out. But um, this process has really shown me the importance of time management and um, making my dancers feel comfortable, especially for a family-friendly show with something like musical theater, Big Spender, it can be seen as sexy, and I didn't want it to come off that way. Um, so yeah, just teaching and making sure everyone's comfortable. What are you excited about with this upcoming Carfi Showcase? I am so excited for all of the pieces. There is so much variety. Um, there's Latin dancing to contemporary to very hard topics and there's even a hip-hop. It's so versatile. There's so many different types of art forms in there. So whoever comes and watches it is really going to get the whole book. How do you think this opportunity helps you grow as a dancer? I definitely think this um, opportunity helps me grow as a dancer um, because being able to teach and express my ideas through a giant group is very important. It shows team leadership, it shows team collaboration, um, and all that jazz. So I was very, very thankful that I was given this opportunity. Awesome. Do you have any last thoughts? Um, just for anyone who comes and see this show, you will not be disappointed. It is going to be a great show. We've already started Tech this past weekend, and it is definitely a show to watch, for sure. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. This has been the last Sharks in the Arts for the semester, and Ana Vertel will be back in the fall. Thank you, Dana. Joining me for our arts update, I have Carrie Corson. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you. I love sharing the arts updates with you. And we love to have you. So what's been going on with arts at NSU? Art Wilk will be on display from April 10th through the 17th at the 6th Annual Art and Stroll, benefiting business for the arts of Broward. DCMA's art faculty member, Tony Alvarez, has a piece that was selected for the juried art exhibition. Event information is online at bfabroward.org. NSU's Art Museum Fort Lauderdale presents Lewis M. Glacken's Pure Imagination, which opens on Saturday, April 13th. Glacken's animation and satire created captivating characters and thought-provoking social commentary. NSU students, faculty, and staff also have complimentary museum memberships. And to learn more about this, visit nsuartmuseum.org. The Rose and Alfred Miniachi Performing Arts Center has several musical events coming up, which will transport audiences back to the 1970s. Almost ABBA will perform with special guest, the she -Gees. Ticket prices are $39. On Saturday, April 13th at 7.30 p.m., those who love Southern rock, they can watch Southern Blood's concert, Leonard Skinner, a tribute. And get tickets for that are $28. Then guests can attend the spring concert, A Million Dreams, for free. And that's on Friday, April 19th at 7.30 p.m. The production features NSU Mako Band and the Bossa Nova Chorale and will spotlight the music of our dreams in a variety of musical styles, including some familiar rock tunes. 
Wow, all of that sounds awesome, Carrie. I'm so looking forward to it. Yes, there's always a lot of really interesting and artistic options at NSU. For sure. Thank you so much for being here and sharing that with us. I love it. Thank you for having me. Up next, Title IX brings attention to sexual assault at a softball game for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Our sports reporter, Emily Potter, has the story. In honor of Sexual Assault Awareness Month, NSU's Title IX and the Nancy J. Cotterman Center partnered together at an NSU softball game. Samantha Giordano explains the importance of this event and the role that NSU's Title IX plays in the community. Um, we wanted to make sure that we can bring as much education and prevention awareness as possible to campus. And I think partnering with different departments on campus and even outside uh, partners in the community is really important to raise awareness and show students that we are here if you ever need us um, and all of the different resources that we can provide and what outside of our community can provide. Title IX works closely with on-campus fraternities and clubs to spread more information about what they do. Students in Phi Delta Theta speak on this connection and why they decide to be a part of this event. Well, because I'm the SAPIS chairman for my fraternity, which is Phi Delta Theta, and my role is to have a communication with the Title IX office, so I, I figured SAAM is the perfect time to spread the message. So I came to this event just to show my support. Um, I also love softball. And I just wanted to be out here and spreading awareness for uh, sexual assault. Olivia Quintero, a victim advocate for the Nancy J. Cotterman Center, expresses what she hopes people take away from this event. That they can call us for help when it comes to any sort of sexual trauma, whether it's from adulthood or childhood. Um, we offer all our services for free and we serve the entire Broward County as well as uh, people from other counties as well. We don't turn anyone away. To report an incident or get more resources, visit www.nova.edu slash Title IX. I'm Emily Potter with Mako TV. Thank you, Emily, for reporting on that. What else is going on with sports? Thank you for having me. I'm glad you asked. The NSU baseball team won in the Sunshine State Conference series finale against the St. Leo Lions this past Sunday. They start their series against Embry-Riddle today at 6 p.m. at the NSU baseball complex. This past week, the NSU softball team swept Flagler in their doubleheader, they will also start their series against Embry-Riddle today at 6 p.m. away. NSU women's tennis was ranked number one team in the NCAA Division II. Unfortunately, they ended their nine consecutive win streak after falling short against Lynn University. Their next match will be Saturday, 10 a.m. against St. Leo University. As the men and women's basketball season have come to an end, our reporter Bella Giacunto got to speak to both teams about their overall seasons. NSU men's basketball team started off the 2023-2024 to season as reigning champions with 10 new players on the roster. Coach Crutchfield explains the pressure on the program coming into this season. 10 new players coming in, I think the pressure was off. We weren't even picked to win our league this year. So you know, I, I felt like there was much less pressure with the new players coming in on me and the program uh, with all the other players leaving. So I really didn't feel the pressure this year. As a veteran sophomore, Ryan Davis expresses what it's like getting to know the new players. Really getting to know the players, the new players, all were great guys this year, so really helped that they were all team players and wanted to, wanted to know, they knew how to win before they got here, so it really helped that they kind of knew what we do here, and that's win, so they were all, they bought in pretty quickly. And Transfer Riker Sisarik shares how trust affected the team this season. Just trust in one another. Um, we knew that you know, we have 16 guys on the team, two redshirted, so 14 guys are available to play every game. And we had trust from top guy to the bottom guy. And I wouldn't even say there is a bottom guy, but it was just there's a lot of trust in one another that we can do the job that we will you know, trust the system as well that Coach Crutchfield implemented. And so just being able to trust that allows like, us to be more comfortable playing with one another and whatnot. So. As the season has come to an end, Coach Crutchfield is already preparing for next season. We, uh, you know, kind of licking our wounds. That's probably as, that's probably about as hurt as I've ever been after a basketball game, and, and I've been at this for a while. And I know the players kind of feel like I do. So, you know, for a while we're just kind of, uh, kind of regrouping from that tough loss, but I still have to do my job. And I'm recruiting really hard to supplement the players that we have coming back. Men's basketball carried themselves to yet another national championship game, but lost at the final buzzer against Minnesota State. I am Bella Giaquinto with Mako TV.
NSU women's basketball made it to the Sweet 16, ending their season during the NCAA Division II South Region Championship. Coach Freeland shares what kept the team motivated throughout the season. I think it was just team chemistry. The, the players really cared about each other. I thought they had fun together. You could see that in the games. Um, the fact that you know we found momentum with the 20-game win streak was amazing. They were able to get the national ranking back again. And I think when you have success like that, it just it helps to, players to stay inspired. And really, the team was all about each other. So they had fun together, and that makes it all worthwhile. Senior Aubrey Stupp expresses how the team's competitive side helped push them through the season. Well, I think it helps because we were all very, very competitive. And we had a lot of seniors this past year, so we wanted to win for them. We wanted to go out big for them. Um, and we're all just so competitive that I think every day at practice we were always working towards the 1% better, um, never settling. Um, we did have some injuries, so I think that was also like a we got to do it for them type of aspect. Um, we were just really, really close and I think that helped us push us so far into the tournament and see how successful we were because we were able to stick together. Ending the season at Sweet 16, Coach Freeland discusses the expectations going into the next season. We're really big believers in supporting each other, also believing in yourself, um, and trusting coaches to help you get better. So next season, we're optimistic that we can, you know, same thing, win conference, hopefully continue to win in the conference tournament, and then go deep in the NCAA tournament, which I do still feel that we had a team that could have gone deeper than even the Sweet 16. Um, unfortunately, the ball didn't quite bounce our way in that Sweet 16 game, but I will say with the seven returning players, it's really left them hungry for prepar preparing for next season so we can take a deep, deeper run. So it's exciting to see where we're going to land. With this being her last season, graduate student Morgan Kane offers a piece of advice for her teammates and future Sharks. My advice that I'd give my Nova Southeastern women's basketball players would be to stay together and just support each other. It's not an individual game. It's a, it's a, team, it's a team sport, so you got to uh, celebrate all the wins and you know, weather the storm for those losses and challenges. And um, those challenges that you experience in the beginning are going to make you stronger and prepare you for success in the tournament and in the NCAA tournament and in all of the postseason. Throughout the season, the women won a program record of 20 straight games. I am Bella Giaquinto with Mako TV. Thank you, Emily and Bella. To end off our show, NSU hosted the 2024 Student Life Achievement Awards. Our general manager and reporter, Madison Casper, has the story. Academic excellence. The 26th Annual Student Life Achievement Awards, better known as the Stewies, was held on Tuesday evening. As nominees gather before the awards, they share how they feel about being nominated. Um, it's such an honor for me. I think it's not really something I ever thought I would be nominated for. And then I got the email and was like, oh my gosh, it's crazy. But it is such an honor and it's so thoughtful and nice like that my like work, my rec like I'm getting recognized for the work I've done over the past four years. President, it feels amazing. It's a culmination of all of our work. Uh, we worked together with so many people, faculty, staff, uh, students, and it just shows that we work together to make our school the best it can be. And uh, it's nice to be recognized for it. It feels great, but it's a, it's a collaborative team effort. It feels great. It's such a wonderful event, put together so well. It feels like at the Oscars. We feel so special. Attendees that have been at multiple Stewies throughout the years share how the event has evolved over time. Uh, well, they, I think there's more participation. The first few years, they weren't on campus. They're off campus, and now you see much more of a community turnout. And I think people, they're more important. You go to office and office, you see people having their little Stewie statue, uh, in, you know, in a prime position. I don't remind us every day, every hour of the day, so. so it's been a continuum. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a great night for all the organizations and recognizing what they do and uh, part of the vitality of the university. After the pre-reception held in the Carl DeSantis building, nominees and attendees moved to the Rosen Alfred Miniachi Performing Arts Center for the awards. After the ceremony, winners of Stewie's expressed what it means to them to receive this award. 
It means, I actually think it just means that what my purpose in life is just to be here for students. And so sometimes it just feels good to get that acknowledgement, to know that you're on the right path, to know that you're impacting lives. Um, I'm only here for students. I only can be the best version of me if it wasn't for you and all the students that go here. So it's for me, it's just, this is more about for them than it is for me. It's just about just to show the students that, hey, I'm here, my purpose is being fulfilled, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I mean, this is just like the perfect end to the chapter of dental school, right? Like we're graduating in a month. I have loved my time here at Nova. You know, I've always wanted to be a dentist. So the fact that NSU plays such a part in that to allow me to fulfill my dream is just un amazing. And I still say this, like I'm so fortunate to be able to go to school here and so fortunate to be trained by these faculty who are so passionate and devoted to their students. President Hanbury has been in attendance at all 26 Deweys thus far. This will be his last Deweys as president, which is why he was honored throughout the entire ceremony. Well, as I said, it brought joy to my heart and tears to my eyes. I, uh, I really didn't expect all of that, but it was certainly appreciated. And uh, I was extremely humbled and honored to receive the praise that they gave. The Office of Campus Life and Student Engagement hosts the Stewies every year. I'm Madison Casper with Mako TV. Thank you, Madison. That is all for the last episode of Mako TV this semester. You can catch our solo release videos on our YouTube channel at Mako Television. You can also follow us on Instagram at NSU underscore Mako TV. Thank you for watching. Mako TV will be back in the fall. Happy summer. See you next time. Go Sharks!